This next portion of the video deals with Random Access Memory, or RAM for short. All semiconductor RAM devices are volatile, which means that the device is unable to retain memory when the power source is removed. Even though a RAM device is volatile, it can be made to maintain its data for a given period of time. This period of time could range from minutes to weeks. To force the RAM device to retain its memory requires a backup power source which is usually in the form of batteries. When RAM circuitry is supported with battery backup circuitry, it is often referred to as non-volatile RAM or NVRAM for short. Most electronic processing systems will require at least some RAM. The amount of RAM required will depend upon the application for the system. There are two basic types of RAM, static and dynamic. Both types have particular benefits and drawbacks. We will examine them separately. We will begin by examining the static RAM first, since it is the oldest and most straightforward form of temporary semiconductor memory. Static RAM uses flip-flops to store individual bits of information. As you recall from Digital 2 of the You Can Do video series, the flip-flop is the most basic form of electronic memory element. The simplest of the flip-flop configurations is the RS or latch flip-flop. It is constructed by crisscrossing the inputs and outputs from two NAND gates. For a more thorough understanding of how the flip-flop works, please refer to the Digital 2 video. Static RAMs are constructed with either bipolar or MOS transistors. The bipolar RAM cell is very fast with typical access time of less than 50 nanoseconds. However, their primary disadvantage is that they dissipate relatively large amounts of power. 0.5 milliwatts per bit is not uncommon. This large power consumption is due to the flip-flop circuit in which one transistor is always saturated. The MOS static RAM cell, on the other hand, produces a much lower power dissipation. Typical power dissipation for the MOS device is only about 0.15 milliwatts per bit. However, access time can typically take as long as 100 nanoseconds. The memory organization used within the static RAM is similar to that used in the read-only memory devices. As you can see, the static RAM uses a row selector section which also contains decoder circuitry, a column selector section which also contains decoder circuitry, data control and input-output control circuitry, and a memory array of semiconductor devices. Reading data from the RAM device is not a complex operation. First, the desired address is selected. Next, the chip enable input, not CE, is brought low. After a very short period of time, the data at the selected address will be present at the output. As you may have noticed, there is only one data output on this device. By simply paralleling the memory ICs, you can create a 4-bit or higher output memory device. By connecting the address and control lines in parallel, the same address in all ICs will be selected simultaneously. Since static RAM uses flip-flops to store each bit of information, and each flip-flop requires the use of six transistors to store a single data bit, there are design limits to the number of reliable transistors which can be manufactured on an IC chip. Also, as the static RAM gains size, the power consumption begins to grow, and the heat generated within the device will begin to affect the operation of the circuit. We will examine a more efficient RAM device later, but for now, we'll pause for a short review of the memory device just discussed. Random access memory devices are volatile, 
since they can only retain data when power is applied. Any loss of power will result in loss of data. Any static RAM device which uses a battery backup system is called a non-volatile or NVRAM device. The NVRAM device will retain its programmable information for short periods of time, days or weeks. The static RAM device uses flip-flops to store individual bits of information. The two major disadvantages of the static RAM device are first, they dissipate too much power, and second, each flip-flop memory cell occupies a relatively large area on the IC which limits the maximum number of cells available. Static RAM devices are available in both bipolar and MOS configurations. The bipolar is the faster of the two, but it consumes more power than does the MOS device. The MOS configuration, however, has a much slower operating speed. This concludes review number five. Next we will examine a RAM device which uses a completely different technology to accomplish data storage. Up until about a decade ago, electronic design engineers would avoid dynamic memory like the plague. Their reasoning was simple. The disadvantages far outweighed the advantages. The primary disadvantage was that dynamic RAM required a lot of support circuitry. It also required three supply voltages and timing was most critical. But today things have changed. Today's inexpensive dynamic RAM devices are much easier to use and are capable of providing more memory for the dollar. Any circuit designer worth their salt must become familiar with this device. The key difference between static RAM and dynamic RAM is the technology used to store the data. As is shown here, each memory cell in a dynamic RAM device stores information as a charge on a capacitor connected to a single MOS transistor. Utilizing single transistor memory cells has accomplished two important objectives. One, much more memory can now be placed in the IC and two, less power per bit will be consumed by the device. To write data into the memory cell, the data bit is placed on the bit line, then the cell is selected through the row or word select line. The capacitor then charges through the MOS transistor to the bit line voltage level. When the row select line turns off the MOS transistor, the capacitor will retain its charge, thereby storing the data bit. Due to the small size of the capacitor used to store the bit of information, the dynamic random access memory device must be updated frequently. The storage capacitor can only sustain its charge for a few milliseconds, therefore each memory location must be refreshed about every two milliseconds. If the cell is not refreshed, it will simply lose its data. Here you see a block diagram of the internal structure of a dynamic RAM device. Actually it looks quite similar to the other memory devices already discussed. The primary difference in this device is its timing control and refresh logic control section. Notice there are three control inputs in this section. One is labeled RAS for row address strobe. One is labeled CAS for column address strobe. And the third is labeled W for write enable. There are several methods used to refresh the dynamic RAM device. The simplest method is called the RAS only refresh. The RAS only refresh method involves holding the CAS input high. When the CAS control input is held high, the output is placed in a high impedance state which in effect disconnects the output from the data bus. The refresh circuitry then selects one row at a time pulsing the row address strobe, low for each row as they are addressed. The sequence of the addressing doesn't matter as long as each cell is refreshed in time. Another variation of the RAS only refresh method is referred to as hidden refresh. 
When using the hidden refresh method, the CAS input is held at a logic low instead of a logic high, as was used in the RAS only method. This allows the valid data to remain at the output while the rows are selected and refreshed. Depending upon the timing of the system, the CAS input may be held low for several microseconds, during which several rows may be refreshed. There are other variations of refresh methods, but these variations add a fair amount of complexity to the dynamic RAM IC. Fortunately, however, there are refresh controller ICs available for many different dynamic RAM sizes and configurations.